All right, welcome to the greenhouse. So this is one of two of our greenhouses that we use for seed starting and plant propagation. And this is where all of the heat mats are. So I thought we would start in here. So earlier yesterday, I asked you guys for a bunch of seed starting questions and things that you're having trouble with. And I've been answering a lot of stuff through direct messages. And then I know in the inbox, Angela and Brianna have been helping a lot of people who are having problems with leggy seedlings and germination issues and you know trying to troubleshoot all of that especially for first time seed starters. So I thought I would go through some of the most common ones tonight, show you how we do some of the things here on the farm. But before we get into it, I want to remind you that we um, put out a winter mini course earlier this winter and into this spring and it's a three part video series all about how to start seeds even if you don't have a greenhouse using shop lights and stuff you can find at the local hardware store or feed store. It's like anybody can do it. It's geared for beginners, but there's a ton of stuff to learn and it's free to take. Plus it has worksheets and handouts and supply lists and everything. So if you haven't already taken the winter mini course, I'd highly recommend that you do that so you can kind of like head off all the questions because I do answer a ton of them in that series. And then I'll go through some more of the like kind of nitpicky stuff in here. So the first question is about dome lids. Do we use dome lids to start all of our seedlings? And we do two different ways. So here on the farm, it's very large scale, right? We're starting each one of these greenhouses fits about 550 trays. So we're starting about 1000 to 1100 trays of seedlings each spring, sometimes more. So we don't always start them on heat mats because there's just not enough room. So we've actually converted our walk in cooler into a germination chamber where we use steam and a little space heater and it works super well. But on a home scale or a small farm scale, this is a great way to do it. So these are professional grade heat mats and you can see that they are underneath the seed trays. You can get much smaller versions. These are generally like five to six feet and they plug into one of these thermostat boxes and we have them set at 70 degrees. That's usually like the kind of average temperature that most seeds will sprout at. We set our newly sown trays on top of the heat mats and then we cover the trays with a dome lid. And what the dome lid does is in order for seeds to germinate, they need warmth and they need kind of humidity. And so we're trapping all of that in there, making it like the perfect environment for seeds to sprout. So these guys just got sown, so nothing sprouted yet, but everything, all the seeds are in there, everything's covered, and then we've got that dome lid. So as soon as we start seeing seeds germinating, as soon as they're starting to sprout, we take the dome lids off. So you can, a lot of people ask, do I leave the dome lid on until 100% of my seedlings sprout? I would say by the time 50% of them have sprouted, you can pop that lid off. So we do use heat mats and dome lids to get things going, but as soon as they've germinated, we do take them off the heat and then we move them onto tables. So you can see if you look very closely, all these little tiny babies have started to sprout. So you've got to look really close when you're pulling that dome lid up and really check in there because some seedlings are very tiny where other things like these cosmos are much larger. So you're just going to want to pop that lid and as soon as stuff starts to sprout, take the lid off and then you can take them off the heat. You can also leave them on the heat, but we generally move them off of the heat because we need those heat mats to start the next seed. Next question is, if I over sowed in a tray, if there are multiple little baby seedlings in a cell, do what do we do? Like what happens next? Do I need to thin them? So typically you do want to thin them down to one little plant per cell because otherwise they're going to get crowded. They're going to all grow together and tangle and they're not going to have enough food to make it from the seed tray out into the garden. Like there's just going to be too much competition. So you can see here in the cosmos, Ideally, we would want one little seedling per cell, but some of these guys have two seedlings per cell. See, there's two there. We've got three in this one. So what you can do is you can either, now this is gonna pain you, you can either take it and pull one out and just throw it on the ground or get rid of it and then just go down to one seedling, or you can actually pop these out, separate all three of them, and then transplant them into another tray. So, you have lots of seeds like we do we just thin we just go through and we toss the extra so we're down to just one the healthiest of the ones that were in the tray or you can divide them either way is up to you but i would definitely say one per cell is ideal okay, so then lots of questions about what if my seedlings are getting really big what do i do if they're outgrowing their tray and i still have like a month before my last frost 
So we actually have done that with some of our babies. We started them a little too early and it's so easy to get really excited and over eager and start your stuff too early. Now, if you did that and your plants are stretching like this and getting really tall and kind of budding up, you know, they, they wanna go outside, but it's still a little bit too cold to do that. So one of the things that you can do is take each one of these little plants and it's a technique, or it's not even a technique, it's called bumping up. You're essentially taking this little plug before it gets too root bound because see, now the roots have started to kind of circle and they're forming this little compact kind of cube and the plant is gonna to start to get stunted. It's gonna run out of food, it's gonna run out of room. So what we wanna do, if I can't plant this guy out, say for another month, I'm gonna to wanna to bump that up into a larger pot. So I could take this and I could plant it into say a four inch pot and then it can keep growing and it can keep having food. It is gonna take up more space under my like grow lights or in my windowsill or wherever you're doing that, but it is gonna let the plant keep growing and it's gonna buy you more time. So bumping up is totally like great to do, especially if you have, you know, a thread of frost still in the forecast for a while like we do. Lots of questions about leggy seedlings. If the little plants are getting like super long and spindly, like you'll see that there's a lot of stem before the leaves start. And these guys, we were trying to show you an example of stressed out seedlings. They actually turned out not as sickly as I was hoping they would look. Um, Sam started these in the house in the window, but then brought them out to the greenhouse and gave them some good natural light and they've kind of rebounded. So you can often save your super leggy seedlings, but if you have seedlings that are leggy, meaning they're very long, it means they're stretching for the light. It means they don't have enough light. So if you have grow lights, and say the grow lights are about this far above your seedlings, they're just stretching, 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 and making this long stem, but the problem is that stem is weak, and it can't hold up the weight of that plant, and so you wanna lower the lights. Or if you're starting them in a windowsill, and they're stretching towards the windowsill, a windowsill doesn't usually give you enough light. You're gonna need more than that if you're growing them indoors. So if you don't have a greenhouse or somewhere with more than just window light, you're gonna to need to provide supplemental light. That is why they're leggy. Or if you are using grow lights, try lowering them and then your plants don't have to stretch so much. So if you've got these really long seedlings, like the really long stems before the leaves begin, or they're starting to curve like this, you can see these guys are getting kind of twizzly or they're just like looking generally kind of weak and long, it means you don't have enough light. Next one is a two part. Okay, so is it too late to start more seeds? So say yours looked way worse than this, but that you were having a hard time or your seedlings are leggy or you had dampening off where everything kind of turns yellow and brown. It's because it got too wet and murky and they died. That's okay, just start over. I've killed so many tens of thousands of plants in my flower growing career. It's totally normal to kill your plants. Like just be, you can almost love them too much or you can overwater them or you can baby them or make it too warm. Like that's very normal. So. If, if you goofed the first round, it's okay. Just start again, sow some more seeds. You're gonna, usually the second time, you have much better luck because you learned. Make sure you watch the winter mini course. That will very much help you. Um, and it's not too late to start seeds. So we are just starting. Our celosia is gonna be starting next week. And we just sowed um, dahlias and zinnias last week, and we're sowing more this week. So we're just getting going on seed starting. You're definitely not too late. Questions about Iceland poppies. Everybody has trouble with these, and if you're having trouble with them, don't worry because that's very normal. So Iceland poppies, the seed is essentially like powder, and it is one of the more advanced seeds to sow. It's just, it's more difficult because they're very tiny, they take a little while to sprout and they're very tender between the time when they first germinate and they get big enough to be kind of bumped up or put outside. So if you're having trouble with them, it's totally normal. We have a blog post called Poppy Primer and it goes through all the different kinds of poppies, Shirley poppies, bread seed poppies, California poppies, and Iceland poppies. And these guys, it gives you tips and tricks. But my trick with these is because the seed is so small and because they take a while to start, rather than so say you sow your seeds be careful not to bury them too deep just barely cover them we use vermiculite over the top of the seedlings rather than potting soil because we find that the seeds have an easier time working their way up through the vermiculite 
And then rather than overhead watering, what we found is if you do the water wand or a watering can, it will wash those little precious seeds away. So instead of doing that, we use what are called no hole trays. So see that tray, like there's no water going through the bottom. We actually fill the bottom of this tray with water, set it in, set these guys in, and actually the water will wick up from the bottom and it will kind of suck it up like a sponge. So then the potting soil will get nice and moist, everything will get watered, but you're not gonna be washing away those seedlings. Now the mistake a lot of people make when they bottom water anything, it's very easy to do inside because if you have grow lights, it's great to use those trays. But what you don't want is to leave your trays sitting in that water all the time because then it's too wet, they're gonna rot or they're gonna dampen off. So if they haven't, any water that they haven't soaked up in say half an hour or an hour, you're gonna wanna take the tray out and then go dump that out. So you're just gonna, like you want the soil to get nice and moist, but don't leave them in standing water because that's gonna be your problem. The last question is about hardening off. So hardening off is the process of transitioning your baby plants from the warm, cozy greenhouse or from your germination chamber or wherever you're growing them and getting them tough enough and able to withstand the kind of variable temperatures and weather that they're gonna find outside. And so that process needs to be gradual and you need to be kind of careful because that's like kind of the step where you can kill a lot of your babies. That's kind of the place that the most things can go wrong. So depending on if your plants are hardy annuals like sweet peas like this and bachelor's buttons and nigella and larkspur, things that can handle some cold, those can start getting hardened off before your last frost. But if you're growing things that are warm season annuals like cosmos and zinnias and celosia, things that can't take any frost, dahlia seedlings, you have to wait until after your last frost to start the process of hardening them off and conditioning them to go out into the garden. So the way that we typically do it is we find a nice sheltered spot. So this is on the north side of our greenhouse and where they're protected from wind and we put the little baby trays out here. So maybe the first, um, we look for good weather where it's not gonna be too windy and too cold and we'll bring the baby plants out. They could even get some sunshine and just come out for the day and then you can put them back inside and protect them at night. And then the next day you could bring them out for a little bit longer and then take them back in and you just are kind of gradually getting them used to outside conditions. Um, and that process is just gonna help them not get totally freaked out once they go out into the garden. So you want to give yourself at least a week, um, sometimes two, to transition those babies to harden them off before they go into the garden. And then oh, this is my last little trick. Okay, so when it comes to sweet peas, the two things that you're gonna find that are your worst pests are when they're in seedling stage, birds are gonna wanna eat the seeds. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna pull the seedling out eat the seed off and leave your seedling to die, or mice are gonna do the same thing. And so in the greenhouse, we protect them from mice by setting mouse traps. And then once we move them outside, we make this little cage over them with bird netting to protect them so that the birds can't get in while the seedlings are growing and getting nice and bulky. So you can see these sweet peas are ready to go out. Chris and I are gonna plant them in the next couple of days. Um, but this is like we're protecting them from hungry birds because in the spring the birds are hungry and they want to eat your very expensive sweet pea seeds. So this is how we protect them. And then once we put them into the garden, the problem that you're going to see there are slugs and snails. So we're going to use, after we plant them, we'll put down Sluggo Plus, which is an organic slug uh, repellent that's safe for children and pets, but it actually works. So that's our, our thing with sweet peas. So Hopefully I answered your questions. I didn't get to everything, but if you have a question, you can totally leave it in the comments below. I'll try to get to those. I'll keep showing you more stuff as things are happening in the greenhouse and just, um, yeah, try to help you have as much success as you possibly can.